Our scripture reading today is Deuteronomy 11, 18 through 21 and 26 through 28. You shall put these words of mine in your heart and soul, and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and fix them as an emblem on your forehead. Teach them to your children, taking, talking about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates, so that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land that the Lord swore to your ancestors to give them as long as the heavens are above the earth. See, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you today, and the curse, if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn from the way that I am commanding you today to father follow other gods that you may have not known. Thanks, Nicole. And thanks for singing. It was really lovely. So wonderful we have some of our young people home for the summer, isn't it? We've been able to share their gifts this summer. As you know, we're in this four-week series on why read the Bible, and you probably guessed there's a method to my madness, right? Why read the Bible as the prelude to introducing reading the Bible five minutes a day, right? This coming up in the fall. Well, I really do have a strong commitment to the, the understanding and trying to figure out why a, an ancient text should be relevant to 21st century life. It's one of those things that I think Vicki said in her children's sermon, people say, is it relevant? I mean, does it have any basis? I mean, come on, the text is, some of these stories are two, three, four thousand years old. And really, should we be basing modern day life on a text that's so ancient? And of course, for those of us who are Christians, the answer is yes. But I think it's more important for us to figure out why we say yes. What is it about that? And so last week, we sort of delved into the beginning of this conversation with that knowing scripture, reading scripture helps us gain knowledge. And we talked about how Calvin even says in the opening of his famous Institutes of Religion, he says, the beginning of wisdom is the knowledge of God and the knowledge of ourselves. And we spoke a little bit about that, that the whole of scripture gives us insight into the character and the nature of God's actions, as well as an understanding of human beings and who they are. It's that beginning part, the knowledge part that we sort of teased out this week. And this week we're gonna go just a little deeper and say, wait a minute, but knowing scripture, reading scripture, engaging in scripture also deepens a sense of wisdom in our lives. Now, just to make sort of a, a comparison, which isn't quite as easy as it sounds, we could speak of knowledge as sort of that thing of knowing the facts, right? When we think about gaining knowledge, or what I was talking about last week, was sort of thinking about the stories about God in the Bible, the stories about human beings, sort of the, the kind of teachings that come out of the scripture, say out of Paul's writings about who we're supposed to be, just really didactic sort of teaching texts. But there's also a bunch of rules that are also in the scriptures that we sort of have to figure out how we're gonna follow those and what we're gonna deal with those. It's sort of knowing those facts about the Bible. But what wisdom does is wisdom says you may know all those facts. You may have a knowledge of the Bible, but wisdom is developed over time as we apply what we read in the Bible, when we integrate from other forms of learning and from our experiences with these stories in the Bible, and then also wisdom is deepened and grow as we have to, in the 21st century, apply and go beyond what the Bible says, sort of extrapolate from the core ideas of the Bible or values in the Bible, and then apply them to a world that is not ever directly addressed in the scriptures. So the first step is to sort of gain a familiarity of actually what's in there. But then the work of the church and largely the work of a community of faith is that deepening part of understanding scripture as we apply it, as we integrate it, and as we sort of go beyond what the scripture says and how does that affect our life as a community and our call to mission and our call to, to live out the Christian life as individuals and as a community. 
Now let's just start with that idea of applying the scriptures. Last week was a good example of that, right? I actually wasn't quite planning to have the Dayton shootings happen, were any of you? But if, they, if we came to church and we didn't talk about the real things in our life, why bother? If we can't talk about the hard intersections of our life when we come to worship, if really what we do is just say, hey, it happened out there and I come in here for my holy huddle or my holy escape, that's really not the call of the Christian life. It's not to separate ourselves. Especially as Presbyterians, we are supposed to step into this world, this rich and wonderful world that God has created, and we're actually called to be a part of it, not to separate ourselves from it. And so we come often with our hearts wide open, hoping that there will be a word. How can we apply what we know of our faith to the tragedies, the circumstances that we find ourselves? And last week, as we talked about those shootings, for me, it was really helpful to find a verse in Romans that, if you recall, we spoke about setting aside the works of darkness and putting on the armor of light. That is one of those sort of direct applications. How do we set aside and wrestle with what it means to set aside the works of darkness and put on the light? And we explored those biblical themes in quite detail. That's an easy way to sort of apply something from the Bible into our 21st century life because there's sort of a, a universal principle behind it. But what about when there's rigid things in the Bible? When there's even other Christian communities that tell us that we must conform to this particular pronouncement or rule in the, in the scriptures, how, how do we wrestle with those things? And as Presbyterians, we often take a step back and we say, well, we want to pay attention to those rules and regulations that may be set out in a very ancient text like Leviticus. But we also want to bring a reading of the whole of Scripture as we re read that particular part. In other words, we're not a community of proof texters. We're a group of people that say we have to look at the whole sweep of the whole thing and let that inform the specifics of what we're trying to apply. And there are times when we do that sort of scholarship on the whole, but we're also people that say, let's be careful about what we apply because that may have been oranges over here in the ancient world, but we don't have any comparison that's like that. Our, our understanding of the world may have changed. And we see in that pattern of sort of taking scripture and interpreting it and, and applying it to the grand principles of what the Bible speaks about in Jesus' very teaching. Listen to uh, some of these in the book of uh, Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount, for example, that amazing sermon where Jesus is sort of applying a moral code of the Old Testament to his audience. And you remember this convention and he says it quite often. You have heard it said in ancient times. In other words, you've heard it or read about it in the scriptures, but I tell you, do you remember this sort of convention? You've heard it said, but I'm gonna tell you it. I'm gonna take what that Old Testament application of a rule is, and I'm gonna blow your minds and expand it into what God really intends. There are things like he says, you've heard it said that an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you that you must love your enemies. Jesus says all sorts of things in this chapter, and I encourage you to go back, but this idea of making sure that when we apply these particular texts of Scripture, that we're looking at the whole of Scripture, which means we're looking at the character and the actions of God, a God who at the end of the day is merciful and loving, that very one who enables us and shows us what it means to put on the armor of light and not to recede and be seduced by the darkness. So this first piece of developing wisdom is how do we read the whole of scripture? How do we understand its context? How do we understand its, its uh, context and where it was written and why it was written? And then taking the principles and drawing those from this and apply that to our lives. But there's another part of the great gift of reading scripture as it deepens our wisdom. It's not just about application, it's actually about the glorious invitation to integrate all forms of other wisdom 
into and conversing as we read scripture. You see, we as Presbyterians don't just take the Bible alone. We say we have to be tethered to it. We have to hold on to it. It has to be part of the conversation, but it's not the only part of the conversation. And as a result, Presbyterians welcome with great joy and great eagerness the wisdom that comes through all the sciences, for example. And a variety of sciences, the hard sciences, the social sciences, these are all the things that we say we come and we read the scriptures with a sort of an opening with what we're learning in school and what we've learned in our lifetimes and we bring it into our reading of scripture. It's at this point that integration of broader wisdom that oftentimes we find ourselves questioning scripture or challenging what we're reading in scripture or challenging our other interpretations of how we've been taught to read scripture. Let me give you an example. I, now, I have never been there, but I understand there's a museum in Kentucky called the Creation Museum. Is that correct? It has kind of a different view of maybe how many of us might see scripture. Now, I'm not going to diminish our brothers and sisters in Christ who've taken that view. But the Presbyterians, when they look at the scriptures and they look at the opening chapters of Genesis, when the scientific movements began to really take up in um, the Enlightenment, and then we have these great theories of things like evolution and science and dating of the world and, you know, my goodness, my three-year-old grandson is so into dinosaurs, I learned more about dinosaurs in the last two weeks than I've learned in the last 20 years. You know, it's this wonderful world of being, of seeing the classifications and the history and the, all of this is so wonderful. And Presbyterians say, hooray, this is great. And then we go, we want to open our Bible and we open it to the opening chapters and we say, hmm, six physical days, does that work? And in this integration of science, we find ourselves asking different questions of this text. It doesn't mean we diminish Genesis 1 in the great story of creation, but now we want to apply our own scholarship, our own rigorous intellectual capacities and study of ancient texts and try to figure out what was behind the writing of this. And most of us would say that from our perspective, this was not meant to be an architectural blueprint of the way that creation unfolded with a timeline that is rigid. Instead, it's a story that enables us to integrate the wonders of science and the wonders of archeology span and the wonders of carbon dating and all these wonderful things and says this is a story that tells us something far deeper about the creative energy of God, of the loving nature of God, rather than telling us simply a step-by-step recipe of how the world came to be. It's that integration that we as Presbyterians love to bring to this conversation when we're deepening our wisdom and understanding more deeply the nature of ourselves and the nature of God. We're not afraid of the questions that it asks. It sends us back to the Bible and asks different questions. And we're excited when we engage when we challenge, when we try to sort of make sense of it all. And even in this integration and this process, sometimes there are things that just simply aren't resolvable. And part of wisdom sometimes is living with the ambiguity of not having everything clear, not having everything nailed down. I mean, isn't that what faith is? Faith is that mystery of the in-between, of a leaning toward, a moving in and out. It's not about surety, but conversations with scripture that engage over time with other people and other Christians who are committed like we are to the integration of all of knowledge and all of wisdom. We look forward to those conversations and grow and deepen our understandings of ourselves and the world around us. But there's also another part of wisdom. Probably one of the most difficult things that we as Presbyterians have had to do in the 21st century. And that is when scripture doesn't directly address the challenges that we face. It's one thing to sort of integrate biology in a reading of, of Genesis 1 and sort that out. but 
what about how does scripture tell us to sort out the things that scripture could not have ever imagined? I can assure you that Abraham walking the patriarch's trail with his Bedouin um, uh, encampment and charges going behind him never ever could conceive of the internet. Never in a million years could Jacob, when he was trying to figure out how to find a wife, ever could think of some sort of internet dating site. <laughs> you know, how do we apply things that really matter to us? And one of the things that happens in a, our lives as we sort of move into that place of integration, we have to not only take the application and the integration, but then we have to trust the what we call theological thinking, taking those big themes, those values, those principles that we learn from scripture and then figure out how we're going to apply them in our current 21st century life. It's not an easy work, but it's the work that we're called to do. And it's the work that we're called as we sort of address issues that may not have surfaced for us. Now, all of that sounds wonderful, but I'm just going to tell you how my week went and how it applies to this, okay? I mean, like, so what? Debbie's talking again about this highbrow stuff. How does it work? So, I'll just tell you a little bit about my week. Tuesday morning, I set aside some time for study. And one of the things I'm working on is that I'm teaching a class on the Psalms for the Cincinnati Women's Club. It's a series of classes that are happening um, from September to May. And so I have to get in my geeky, nerdy, biblical scholar head, and I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to talk about the Psalms over nine lessons. And I've, I've got all my commentaries out. I've got all my notes. I've got books on the Psalms. I'm just in my head trying to figure all this out. I'm thinking about what's the best way to do all this. And one of the things, of course, that I love talking about with the Psalms are the creation Psalms. And there are several Psalms that just speak with just a magnificence about God's creative hand in the universe. So I'm reading through all these various Psalms, trying to decide which one I'll use for that lesson to make that point or however it's all gonna go. And, and then of course I read the opening chapters of Genesis, and then I'm reading in Colossians about Christ and creation, and I'm just trying to integrate all of this stuff. I'm trying to apply and integrate and do all of that. And my brain got a little tired. I'm totally up here, and like many times what I do is I have to do all that intellectual rigorous uh, work, and then I just have to let it aside for a while. I don't start that teaching till September, so I have some time, and I thought, I'll just let it go. My brain's kind of tired. I don't really quite know what to do, but a good start. Then on Thursday, I did something I've never done before. I finally went to the Cincinnati Zoo. <laughs> you know, I mean, you go to the zoo a lot when you have kids, right, or you're a kid, but I'm a little older than that. My grandkids don't live here, but somehow I had not gone to the zoo yet. So Theo Tucker, who volunteers at the zoo, took me all around the zoo. It was really, really fun. But it was an interesting experience having just spent all of Tuesday thinking about creation and then being at the zoo and seeing the diversity of creation. Right, I could know something about creation and all that in this sort of highbrow way, but there it was in full living color. I mean, I just got such a kick as we went from sort of display to display. And I have to tell you that my favorite thing at the zoo, which really surprised me, was the insect house. I mean, it's awesome, right? I mean, there were colors on insects that I could never have imagined. And as Theo and I were talking, as we were dry walking all the way through the zoo and everything, I just kept thinking, this diversity that God has is just so amazing. And we kept commenting on it. And somebody had said something to me last week about, don't you think we just came from bacteria? And I'm thinking, not when I go to the zoo. <laughs> it seems like there has to be the hand of something, something that helped put in motion this creativity that's on full display. And it's not about you know, believing in evolution or not believing in evolution or being a creationist or not. It's just this sense of awe and wonder that comes. Well, as I was just drawn into the beauty of creation and the diversity of creation, I began reflecting on not only the beauty of all those unique markings and the unique shapes and sizes and experiences and, and life, um, the, uh, the environments that all these animals live in, but I began to think about the gift of that diversity and how we need all of that diversity and how those parts of a, an emerald colored beetle somehow is as necessary as the grandest 
of elephants. But it was interesting because as I thought about that, I began to reflect on something that I didn't see at the zoo necessarily, and that was the diversity of our human population. Because of some reading I've been doing, I was thinking about racism. And I was thinking about the diversity of gender expression and of orientation. And again, thinking a God who is so creative to have put a sort of a canvas with all of these amazing animals also paints with a canvas where each one of us is unique where the color of our skin or the, the experiences of our culture or our, our backgrounds, our ages from the youngest to the oldest are part of this incredible display of God's diversity. And yet I really hadn't thought about how much it was the beauty of diversity and being created in the image of God, which is something I hold, but that it's actually a blessing, that it's a gift. It's a gift that we need to embrace. And as I began to reflect on that and going back to scripture, I was reminded of Paul who says, there's no male or female, Greek or, um, uh, Greek or Jew, uh, slave or free, that we are all one in Christ. And it just sort of opened my heart up to realize that even who I am and my diversity, as an American white woman, Instead of feeling sort of the humiliation of sometimes that's associated with what people would call my privilege in life, I found myself just feeling like I was part of a, an amazing diversity of all of creation. And it meant that I didn't need to over elevate who I am and my privilege, but it also didn't mean that I needed to diminish who I am or to humiliate myself before others. There was something about seeing all of creation and its diversity and its harmony. It was, it was almost like this spiritual sort of awakening to the sort of unity of all of us. And that impacted me when yesterday, the leader, one of the leaders of our denomination spoke at Presbytery, an African-American woman from the same part of the country I'm from, she's from Oakland, California, spoke about the call our church to address issues of racism. And instead of feeling shame or feeling angry or anger, I just felt open to really hear what she had to say. I didn't find myself unnecessarily defensive. I just found myself open and curious to hearing what God was doing. You see, it's that process of, of applying and integrating that process of then going beyond even the situations that we find ourselves in that the Bible doesn't directly address, but God is still present in that conversation with us as we interact with scripture. It's like having that conversation with that old friend that you may not have seen for a long time and suddenly as you're talking and sharing together, you just connect on that deep, deep level it's as if no time has passed and you don't even have to talk about the superficial. You can go right to the depth of the core of who you are and who they are. Why read an ancient text for the 21st century? Because it deepens wisdom. It gives us the ability and the invitation to apply what we read, to integrate the wisdom that's all around us and knowledge all around us. And it enables us to extrapolate into those core principles of who God really is and who God calls us to be. And that's why, or at least one reason why, we read the Bible. Amen.